Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, hello. Um, this afternoon, I'll be talking to you about um, and sharing some ideas with you about three things, and they are dance, thinking, and hormones. Now, all these three things are very close to my heart. Uh, primarily because I run the Dance Psychology Lab at a University of Hertfordshire, where we do a great deal of research looking at dance and the effect dance has on people and organisations. So we look at the effects of the health benefits of dancing for people with Parkinson's disease, for instance. Or we might try and understand, you know, how is it the case that we recognise things that are being communicated through dance? How does the brain do that? We do that kind of work in the lab. But also, dance has played a very important part in my life. And I think... It's almost certain that had I not been a dancer, I would never have been a psychologist. I think had I not been a dancer, um, I don't know what my life would have amounted to at all. So I'll tell you why. So this email came through to me about a week or so ago on my desk, and it filled me with fear and dread and confusion. My heart rate went up, and it just felt awful. And when I looked at this email, it reminded me of the horrible childhood I had. Because when I looked at it, I didn't understand a word it said. <laughs> now, that's okay. It's okay. I know it's, written, not, it's not my language. I, speak, I, I read everything in English, just about. But it had examples of why I was so terrible at reading English. So when we come down the list to start with, we've got this first word, I can't say, riser, reference, something. I guess that means reference number. Um, and then we've got risender, which I'm guessing is passenger. And then it's got flyvening. <laughs> now, flyvening. When I look at this, it's just got too many letters in it. There are too many letters in fly. Why isn't it flying? Flying. You could take out the V and the N. They're completely surplus to requirements. Uh, they are. And then you come down the list. You come down the list. And then we get some other ones. Here we are. The next, almost, almost this one here. Hand baggers G. <laughs> and I look at this and I think, how do I say that S-J-E? I've got to obviously say it somehow. S-J, I say. That doesn't make sense. And then finally, they, they come down a bit, a bit further, and we've got, I just can't pass them at all. Here we are, uh, how are you? Priscatecori. <laughs> Prisk, Prisca, to, I have no idea. So the problem with this particular word is I don't know how to pass the word. I don't know, I'm guessing it's made up of two individual words, but I don't know where they start and where they finish. And without knowing where they start and where they finish, I can't make sense of what the word is. Now, of course, eventually I read it over and over again, and I worked out what everything meant, because like, there were lots of cues in there. But this is so indicative. When I was growing up, I had very profound reading difficulties. And when you're a teenager with very profound reading difficulties, all words look like this. And so I was reading in English, but all the English words I was reading looked like that. And it was impossible to make sense of what they were saying. And so I started to read, or trying to read, and I couldn't read. And one of the problems with not reading when you're a teenager is that you obviously can't be put in for exams in things because you can't sit exams because you can't read very well. And you can't learn things. And if you can't learn things when you're a child, then, of course, teachers who know everything call you stupid. And they say, oh, you can't read something, so therefore you're stupid. And this goes on, and they don't put you in for exams, so you end up leaving school without any qualifications and with, with not much of a future. So this is certainly the case that happened to me. I had very profound reading difficulties and found life very difficult in, in a reading domain. When I tried to read, or when I saw blocks of text, things just felt awkward. It felt awkward, difficult, and clumsy, and horrible. And that was pretty much what life was like at school. But I was incredibly lucky. And I was incredibly lucky because I could dance. And I was able to dance, and I did dance. When I danced, it didn't feel clumsy. It didn't feel awkward in any way. It just felt like the most natural thing in the world. It felt like breathing. It just felt really completely natural. And I was incredibly lucky to, have, to be able to then earn a living as a dancer. So I left school, and I trained as a professional dancer, and then I worked into the world as a professional dancer, dancing all over the place, which was fab fantastic. Um, and then suddenly I realized that, well, if I can learn all this stuff in dance, what would happen if I applied my ability to learn dance to my ability to learn words? which I've been blocked out of for all my life, pretty much. So what I started to do was to use techniques in dance, rhythms and patterns, and breaking things down in a very physical way that I was very used to doing, and applying those rules and techniques to words. And what I was able to do was to finally learn to read. 
And so I learned to read when I was, well, started to learn to read when I was 22. And it was d- applying the dance-based rules that enabled me to open up all those words. So previously, I'd look at a block of text, and it would look like just a black block on the screen or on the page. And they, there weren't any individual words in there. It didn't make sense. So I applied these things I had to do from dance to the reading, and eventually, over a period of time, I learned to read. So that was very important to me. Once I'd finished learning to read, I then realized, of course, that once you can read, you're no longer stupid, which is great, because you, can, you know stuff about the world. You can read newspapers, and all of a sudden, you know where different things are happening in the, around the world. It's amazing, the things you can suddenly access when you can read that you can't before. So once I realized I wasn't stupid, I thought, I know, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll become a university academic. I thought, um, I'll go to Cambridge University and be a university academic at Cambridge. Well, clearly, I was still just a bit stupid enough to believe I could do this. And, um, and so I started on that path, and so I did some qualifications, and then did a degree in psychology, and then a master's degree in psychology, and then did my doctorate, um, and then did my postdoctorate at Cambridge, uh, eventually. And so, but what really inspired me for all of that was dancing. And then finally, so when I got to there, I thought, well, how is it the case that dancing can unlock these thought processes? How is it the case that dancing can help someone to learn to read and learn to think? So what I then did was to start to do research into dyslexia, reading difficulties, and thinking and creativity. And what I'd like to share with you now is a couple of little ex- experiments we've done where we've looked at the relationship between dance and thinking to see how we've this relationship. Okay, so the first thing is there are two types of thinking I want you to think about now. The first type of thinking is the type of thinking where you have to solve a problem and the problem only has one right answer. So here's the problem. Uh, what, what is uh, five times three? 15, well done, you can shout them out, that's great. That's great. Uh, you guys didn't get that, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> they got it. Okay, let's get this one. What's uh, 15 times 3? 45, lovely, well done. Well, everyone over here now. What's uh, 43 times 9? 43 times 9. Well, I won't give you the answer, just say, keep thinking about the answer to 43 times 9. You'll probably go through some steps at the moment in your head to try and find the answer. I won't tell you just, just yet. But what you're doing here, you're trying to solve a problem where there's one answer to that problem. That's called convergent thinking, converging on one problem. Okay, a different type of problem. I'm about to give you a household object, and what I want you to do is to think of as many alternative uses for that object as you can think of. Now, these aren't uses for which the object was designed. They're completely alternative uses. So the, uh, the, now what I want you to do is to find a use for that an alternative one and throw it out of your mind, generate another one, throw that one out of your mind, and generate another one. Okay? So see how many you can generate. Here we go. The household object is, for the alternative uses, is a household brick. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. (laughs) It's a a household brick. 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 Oh, thank you very much. Uh, A brick. What could you use a brick for that it wasn't designed for? Juggling, Juggling, yes, you could juggle bricks, that'd be fantastic, yep. Breaking a window, yep, that's that's another good one. A bookshelf, yep, good one. Lovely. Well, we, the other ones I have shouted out normally are things like um, to put in a bag of puppies and throw in the river. <laughs> uh, to drown the and the other one I had is uh, to rub on a, they're quite rough bricks, and you can rub it on your skin to rub a wart off your skin. <laughs> That's a horrible one. Um, okay, so we've got, got those two. Now, what we've done in the, in the lab is to get people dancing in all kinds of different ways to see how it affects their ability to problem solve. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to teach you a little technique for making you faster at one type of problems and more creative with the other type of problem. Okay? Here we go. So, right, could you all um, just put your your books down and everything down on the floor? Just free up your hands. Just free up your hands. Okay, can you all please, uh, what I'd like to do is to slap your thighs twice for me, please. Brilliant. All in time now. Five, six, seven, and a... Lovely, lovely, lovely. Now let's clap twice. Both together. Here we go. And... Lovely. You're going to do that lots and lots of times. And in between that, we've got five things for you to do. The first thing you have to do is called the hover. So it goes like this. Here it goes. It goes five, six, seven. We go and one, two, three, and we hover. Lovely. And again, oh, one, two, three, and hover. Now the next thing is the mashed potato. Keep going. We go a mashed potato, mashed potato. One, two, three, a mashed. Lovely, lovely. Uh, it could be you. It could be you. lovely. We got the hitchhiker. And again. 
And the hitchhiker and the hitch. And one last one. The John Travolta. <laughs> and the John Travolta, John Travolta. Great, you got that? You got that? <laughs> right, what we're going to do, we're going to play a little video. And um, I want to, so when we start the video off, I want you to do that two each. So we do two hovers, two mashed potatoes, two it could be used, two hitchhikers, and two John Travolta's. All right, I'll lead the way, and you can follow it on the video as well. Here we go. It could be you. Lovely. And it could be now the hitchhiker. And another hitchhiker. And finally the John Travolta. And one more time. Brilliant. Well done, well done, well done. That's great. Right, what we're going to do next, we're going to do the same again, but this time, this time, just one of each. So we'll do one hover, one mashed potato, one it could be you, one hitchhiker, one John Travolta, and we'll do the whole thing all over again, okay? Get it locked in the head this time. It's going to get harder. And here we go. Six, seven, and... Now we'll do a mashed potato. Lovely. Uh, and now we're doing it could be you. And a hitchhiker. It's all science. John Travolta. John. Oh, from the top again. Here we go. There we go. One of them. A bit of a hitchhiker. And there we are. And finally, a bit of a John Travolta. Great, 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 great. Well done. So now the next thing, yeah, well done, well done. <laughs> next time, next time, it's twice as fast. Twice as fast, okay? So it's like twice, are you ready? Here we go, and... It could be you. And from the top. And that potato. It could be you. One of them. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. That's great. Now the next time, it's the last time you've got to do it. This time I want you to improvise. Make it up. Always do a slap and a clap. And then do any of those five movements. Don't keep doing the same one over again. Don't plan it in advance. Improvise on those five movements. Do anything you like in any order you want. Don't copy the person in front of you. Just make it up. Are you ready? <laughs> Surely good. Right, here we go. Okay, you've got all ready. Hit improvise. Let's make it all up. Here we go. And... Ready to do something different. Come on. Come on be very creative. So ready. Try something new. What haven't you done? Oh, give yourself a clap. Well done. Well done. Well, well done. So. So. Let me... Okay, so here we are. The, the science of this is, when we get people doing that in the laboratory, we find two things. When people do structured dance, it makes them faster at solving convergent problems. It makes them faster at solving problems like, what's 43 times 9, or what's 5 times 3? It speeds up your cognitive processes, even when you dance physically and you have to solve problems mentally or writing them down. It speeds you up. The second thing it does, when you do the improvisation part, all the making it up, well, you do 20 minutes worth of making stuff up, whether you make it up physically with your body or make it up with music or make it up with words, it makes you more creative in the sense that you're able to find more solutions to divergent thinking problems. It makes you more creative, which is fantastic. And what we're currently looking, at, looking into, we're doing the research at the moment, is applying this in schools to see how school children can learn material sort of convergent material like, like learning the science curriculum. You know, can movement in the classroom, if you've got children moving in classrooms, will it make them um, faster at solving problems and more creative and divergent in their ability to think? Right. Um, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Stand up, stand up, stand up. 
lovely, lovely, lovely. Right, could you all please, well, wait, 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 could we all just uh, imagine, we're at, it's, it's a wedding, you're at a family wedding, and could you all, going that way, as you want to think, just, just do, do, do this for me. Could you just do that step, and touch, step, and that's, that's it, that's it, lovely, lovely. Let's have some music on there. Is it me doing the music or you? It's, uh, no, it's you too. Thank you. Is that some music? Thank you very much. Right, we got a bit of music then. Oh, okay, lovely. Okay. Now, just, just get the rhythm on this. Oh, don't stop. Oh, it's fine. Here we go. Uh, we go and snap. Now, what I want you to do now is find that groove. Just find the groove in the music. Now, imagine you're at a party or a disco or somewhere, and then suddenly the most attractive person in the world has walked in, and they're standing right there. And you look at them and you think, blimey, that's the most attractive person in the world. And then they suddenly they look at you and you can see in their eyes that they're thinking, oh, you're the most beautiful person in the world. So lock into that gaze, close your own eyes, and I want you just to let yourself go and really dance. Come on, let's go, let's go. Let's imagine it's a dance, let's go. Oh, lovely. Keep going to the chorus. Oh, here we are. And that person is dancing the same way as you. Oh, it's a wonderful feeling. Lovely, oh, oh lovely. I take you to each other. Sit down, sit down. Right, so. Yeah. It feels good. It feels good. It feels good. Now, do you know what? The way you were dancing just then, the way you were dancing just then is influenced, apparently, and this is proven, it's been published in a scientific journal, so it must be true, the way you were dancing just then was influenced by the relative size of your ears. <laughs> now, it's true. Well, it's, it's, it's published. <laughs> the idea is the, the size of your ears, the relative size of your ears, one might be huge, one might be small, according to some scientists, it suggests it tells us something about your genetic quality, your underlying genetic makeup. <laughs> and if your ears are exactly the same size, it means you're almost a perfect specimen. And what has been found in these very scientific controlled studies is that when people dance, if you just take a, an image of somebody dancing and you can't see anything about them, the people who dance who've got perfectly the same size ears as each other are apparently rated as better dancers than people who dance with lopsided ears. <laughs> absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Now, the other thing that we found fascinating, so this is the whole uh, genetic quality, has also suggested that the size of your fingers also has an impact on how you dance and move. Now, I'm afraid I haven't got time to show you this video, so in the last 18 seconds I'm going to speak really, really quickly. But what we're going to do, we can have a couple, but we have a minute longer, I think, um, is um, the, size, the relative size of your fingers, particularly these two fingers here in a man, are an indicator of your degree of what's called prenatal testosterone. Some men have high degrees of prenatal testosterone, and some men don't. And it's been argued that women want to find men with high levels of prenatal testosterone. And what's apparently been found is that men with high levels of prenatal testosterone dance differently to men with low levels of prenatal testosterone. And when they dance, women rate them, those high testosterone men, as being more attractive in the way they dance. So I thought, I've got to do that. I've got to do something with this. <laughs> so... <laughs> um, we went to a, can I play this video? Can I play the video? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, let's, let's play the video. Thank you very much. Um, let's have, so we went to a nightclub. I'll talk, talk to you so that we're doing it. Went to a nightclub, and we measured hundreds of people coming into their nightclub. We measured their hormone levels, their relationship status. We watched them dance, both in the main dance floor and also here on the little side dance floor as well. And we looked at everything to do with them, their personality. We gave them a whole battery of tests. And one of the things in the women we looked at was their degree of fertility, so how fertile they were in a stage of their cycle. And this young woman here, for instance, was at the very fertile stage of her cycle. <laughs> and the, we looked at men as well, and we looked at men dancing, and some men had very low levels of testosterone. <laughs> these are the testosterone, these are the men that women tend not to want. And some men have very high levels of testosterone. <laughs> and this man here had the highest level of testosterone in the nightclub on, on that day, which is incredible. And, uh, <laughs> and what we did with these people... Um, we then we, we took all these videos we took of, of hundreds of men and women dancing, and we then uh, we grayscaled the videos out, so we, we blurred the image out, so you couldn't really see it. It was like looking through beer goggles. And we blurred them out, 
And, um, and then we, we asked men to rate the women for attractiveness. And what we found is that the women dance in a particular way. When women were at the fertile stage of their cycle, they tended to isolate their hip region more. They move their hip region quite a lot, and they keep everything else still. And then we put eye-tracking goggles on men. And we said to the men, look on this woman's body, a full-size body, and tell us how attractive she is. So, of course, what happened is the men went... And they said, oh, she's got a pretty face. And then, so that was, and then, then we asked so the women who are less a fertile stage of their cycle. Now, they still move their hips a lot, but they then move their arms a lot too. And their legs, they moved everything. They moved around a lot, and there's all this kind of movement going on. You know, that kind of movement going on. And then men with the eye-tracking glasses looked all over the body. They were looking at the hands, the head, the feet, everywhere. And they said, no, not very attractive at all. <laughs> it was incredible. And so then we took the same woman dancing every week for six weeks, or eight weeks it was, and we, we measured her dancing every single week, every single week. And exactly the same happened thing happened even in the same woman. So the same woman danced differently at different stages of her fertility cycle, and men looked at different parts of her body and rated her as more or less attractive as a consequence of that, which is incredible. So, um, <laughs> what we know from all this stuff is that we are biologically born and driven to dance. You know, if dancing is an expression of our hormonal and genetic makeup, it suggests that dancing is one of the most natural things in the world that we can do. We also know, of course, that dancing has this amazing impact on our thinking and thought processes. So, the idea I think that it's worth uh, spreading today is that dancing is a fundamental part of who we are and can have a huge impact on our ability to learn. So thank you very much.